Hi everyone, in this video we're going to talk about nucleophilic addition to ketones and aldehydes. So first, let's just review the resonance structures of aldehydes and ketones, because that's going to help us understand nucleophilic addition a little bit better. So let's draw an aldehyde and a ketone. And we're just using generic aldehydes and ketones here. Okay, so uh, how could we move electrons around on these structures to draw our resonance structures? So we're just going to move our pi electrons up to oxygen, which is more electronegative. So for both the aldehyde and the ketone, that's going to create a uh, negatively charged oxygen and then a positively charged carbon. All right, now let's draw the hybrid structures for both. So for the aldehyde, we can see that the oxygen is partially negatively charged and then the carbon down below is partially positively charged. That's the same for the ketone. Okay, so if we highlight those uh, carbons that are partially positively charged, we can see that they are electrophilic. And that means they are susceptible to nucleophilic attack. So a nucleophile could come in and attack that partially positive carbon, and we can create new molecules. Now, one thing also to keep in mind, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So not only do we have this resonance structure here, um, but we do also have that inductive effect. Now, one other thing to note, aldehydes are actually more susceptible to nucleophilic attack uh, than ketones. So why is that? So let's draw an aldehyde versus a ketone. So what is the main difference between an aldehyde and a ketone? So an aldehyde has a hydrogen and one alkyl group on either side. A ketone has two alkyl groups, right? So one reason that an aldehyde might be more susceptible to a nucleophilic attack is it's a little more accessible. Um, it doesn't have two potentially bulky alkyl groups on either side. So aldehydes have only one alkyl group. So more accessible. So this has to do with sterics. Okay, um, how could these alkyl groups affect the stability of the aldehyde and the ketone? So what's that uh, long H word <laughs> that we've talked about before with alkyl groups and stabilization? Hyperconjugation, right? So um, ketones are, or at least the um, carbonyl carbon, which we know is partially positively charged, that can be stabilized by these alkyl groups uh, through hyperconjugation. So the um, aldehyde, So the aldehyde carbon 
in our carbonyl group is only stabilized by one alkyl group through hyperconjugation. So it's a little less stable than a ketone, which means again that it's more likely to react. So aldehydes are less stable than ketones. and more uh, quickly react, or more uh, quickly to react. Or wait, is, <laughs> is that grammatically correct? Let's see, let's rewrite that. Uh, aldehydes are less stable than ketones and will react faster. There we go, that's, that's a better way of saying that. Okay, so now uh, let's look at a couple of different scenarios for nucleophilic addition. Um, you might either have basic conditions or acidic conditions. So let's start with our basic conditions. So we'll just draw a, um, an aldehyde since we know that it's more reactive than a ketone. And let's say we're under basic conditions. So in the first step, the nucleophile is going to come in and attack that partially positive carbon, which will move electrons up to oxygen. So then we form a negatively charged oxygen and then our nucleophile has substituted in or added in. Um, and now we have our alkyl group and hydrogen as well. Now, notice that I drew equilibrium arrows here. So just keep that in mind. We'll talk about that in a second. In the last step of this uh, mechanism, we just need to protonate the oxygen. I keep hitting the next slide. All right, so that's our final product. We have an alcohol group and then whatever our nucleophile is. Um, so let's go back to our equilibrium arrows. Why is this an equilibrium situation? Well, there's a lot of different nucleophiles that we could use for this reaction and some of them might be a potential leaving group. For instance, um, what if we were using a bromide ion as our nucleophile? So Br minus. Once that's added onto our aldehyde, that bromine could act as a leaving group. So we could go back to the reactants. Um, and there's other potential nucleophiles that could act as leaving groups as well. Okay, so how would we prevent uh, equilibrium um, going back towards reactants? How do we favor products? So let's review Le Chatelier's principle a little bit, or Le Chatelier. So what are some ways that we can favor the formation of products? So remember way back when we talked about Le Chatelier's principle, um, we said that we could add stress onto a reaction in order to push it to the left or to the right, either towards reactants or products. So one way that we could add stress onto this reaction is by adding more nucleophile, so more reactants. So 
So that will favor the products because the reaction will try to shift in such a way to relieve the stress on the system. Um, but there are other ways that we could favor the product. So another way is we could just remove the product as it forms. And at, if we're removing product, then the reaction wants to shift towards the products to try to reestablish equilibrium. And finally, we could also just use a really strong nucleophile or um, rather an unstable nucleophile so that it really wants to react and it doesn't want to leave the um, product and go back towards reactant. So if your nucleophile is unstable, um, then it would rather be bonded to something. And so that will also favor products. Okay. Now let's look at um, acidic conditions. What would that mechanism look like? So under acidic conditions, the mechanism is a little bit different. So we would have acid in our reaction flask and the oxygen atom is going to be attracted to the proton on the acid. So our first step is protonating the oxygen. And then in our second step, the nucleophile will attack that carbon, the uh, partially positively charged carbon. All right, so then we need to just deprotonate our nucleophile in the last step. So I'll just write minus H plus. And we end up with that same product. All right, so just notice that under acidic conditions, we don't have any negative charges. Under basic conditions, we don't have any positive charges. Um, so Again, under basic conditions, we start with the nucleophile attacking the aldehyde or the ketone. Under acidic conditions, we start by protonating the oxygen on the carbonyl group. Oh, the other thing to note, if we look at our product, notice that we have a stereocenter. There's four different groups bonded to that carbon. So we would actually end up with a racemic mixture and I'll also write this on the last slide as well, just so we don't forget. So let's summarize what we've learned so far about nucleophilic addition. So the first thing to remember with nucleophilic addition reactions is that you are under equilibrium conditions. So you might have to put some stress on the system in order to favor the products. Um, so for instance, um, you might need to use an unstable nucleophile or add more nucleophile or just have a high concentration of your nucleophile.
Now, if your nucleophile ends up being a good leaving group, then your reactants will be favored. Now, the other thing to remember, we said aldehydes are more likely to react than ketones or they're more susceptible to nucleophilic attack. So aldehydes are more likely to form the product than ketones because aldehydes really want to react to become more stable. So aldehydes um, are less stable than ketones. and more likely to react. So they are more likely to form the product. Okay, so let's talk about some nucleophiles that we would typically use in a nucleophilic addition reaction with aldehydes and ketones. Now, uh, I'm going to divide these up by uh, their main atom or their kind of central atom. So let's look at oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, and then down below hydrogen and carbon. Okay, so some nucleophiles that contain oxygen would be, for instance, water. Um, we could have an al um, hydroxide. Um, an alcohol. Or a diol. So remember, diols have two alcohols. Um, some sulfur-containing nucleophiles would be dihydrogen sulfide, or similar to the diol, you can have two sulfurs. And then some nitrogen-containing Nucleophiles would be um, amines. So you could have a primary amine or a secondary amine, but you can't use a tertiary amine. You have to have that hydrogen there. Um, some hydrogen containing nucleophiles would be, for instance, lithium aluminum hydride or sodium borohydride. And then under carbon, we have Grignard reagents, where X could be bromine or chlorine, so one of the halogens. Um, you can also use a nitrile group as a nucleophile. Or you can use um, something called phosphorus illid. Oh, actually, instead of pH there, I meant to just write a P for phosphorus. I was looking ahead on my notes, but that phosphorus is bonded to three phenyl groups. Apologize if you were writing in pen there. So again, that pH is a phenyl group. And remember, phenyl groups are basically benzene rings. So phosphorus illid is a really big molecule with all those benzene rings attached to the phosphorus. Okay. 
So I think that's all we'll talk about in this video. In the next one, um, we're going to go over some of these nucleophiles and their mechanisms. Um, so we'll start with oxygen nucleophiles and the products that they form. Uh, and then we'll move on to nitrogen and some of the other types of nucleophiles after that. So I will see you in the next video.